that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Um, so uh, we've got a, a very authoritative panel, and it's a huge privilege for, for, for us to have them here. Some of them I know quite long since the, uh, was it Technicon days, I think when it was still mentioned. Uh, we don't have those anymore. And, uh, and welcome, and we look forward to sharing with us. We, we have Kerrigan McCarthy here from NICD that will share some, some uh, perspectives with us. We've got Lucia Annelich from Annelich Consulting. We have Otto Conradi from NSF Africa, and then Blaine van Rensburg from Sovereign Foods, and then Linda Jackson as well. Um, that's also going to share some quite personal experiences with us um, in terms of her endeavors with regard to culture. So we're starting with uh, Kerrigan. Um, uh, we're going to use the same format. She's going to share a presentation with us, and then we're going to have a, a discussion. So you're welcome. So thank you, Linda and Rick, and uh, the audience. Lovely to be with you this afternoon. Um, I wanted to uh, show just a few slides. Um, and I'm not sure who's pressing the <laughs> button for the next slide. Okay. Um, but one of, our, um, one of the things that I wanted to primarily share with you is what is the role of the National Institute for Communicable Diseases? Um, what is the NICD and what do we do insofar as food safety is concerned? Obviously, um, a few of you, or there might be those amongst you who'd never heard of the NICD before the Listeria outbreak. And uh, with us sort of being catapulted into the limelight, um, it's left the, the general public with quite a number of misconceptions about what we do. The second thing is that I want to show, uh, share with you is to uh, give you some uh, photographic, uh, uh, a photograph, quick photographic tour around the, the Enterprise factory at the time of the, uh, the visit where we made the connection between the outbreak and the, uh, um, and the factory itself. Um, and uh, quickly in, in a sentence or two, just share with you where their lapse uh, of uh, safe food safety was. Um, and then uh, go through the timelines, what happened and when. So um, the NICD, what do we do? Um, if you go to our website and you look at our uh, mission statement, you'll see that it says there that the NICD is a resource of knowledge and expertise in regionally relevant communicable diseases to the South African government, SADC countries and the African continent in order to assist with planning of policies, programs and to support appropriate responses to communicable disease problems and issues. You don't see food safety, environmental health anywhere in there, and that is because that's not our role. Our primary role is around uh, doing surveillance for communicable diseases, and diseases mean people uh, in this context. So we don't look at animal diseases, we look at human disease, and we look for cases of human disease. Our second role is outbreak investigation. So we got catapulted into the Listeria outbreak because uh, we were doing surveillance for human disease. Listeriosis was one of them. And we noted that there was, in fact, an outbreak. And then we landed up, as part of our role in outbreak investigation, coordinating uh, an emergency operations center, um, which was the venue where the Listeriosis incident management team uh, convened. And the incident management team comprised a whole multi-sectoral group of people from a range of government uh, institutions and departments um, that have a place to play or a role to play in um, outbreak investigation and management of uh, a foodborne disease illness. We also are responsible for research related to public health improvements and we perform reference laboratory functions. So one of those reference laboratory functions was critical in solving the outbreak, which is why the NICD played such a pivotal role. And that is something called whole genome sequencing. So the NICD uh, is able, along with uh, many tertiary and, and research institutes, able to uh, sequence the genome of uh, in any and many different organisms. And it was the genome sequencing that allowed us to match isolates of listeria from one place or the next, from food and environmental sources, and do that critical linking exercise that identified uh, the source of the outbreak. Uh, how is the NICD structured? Uh, crazy that I should be putting up an organogram here, but this gives you a sense of um, how we work. Um, if uh, this is our head, and our current head is Professor Lynn Morris, she's an A-rated scientist, she's an HIV scientist actually, um, and we all report into her. Um, our, our NICD is divided into a number of um, centers, and the centers um, each have their own speciality. So there's a center for enteric diseases, 
and the enteric disease centers looks, looks after listeriosis. The uh, outbreak response unit falls within the Division of Public Health Surveillance and Response, and they are responsible for uh, doing outbreak investigation. So how were we involved? What was our role? Uh, firstly, we recognized that the outbreak took place. Secondly, we were doing surveillance for cases. Um, we uh, included molecular testing of isolates. We developed uh, and implemented a strategy to identify the source of the outbreak, and we coordinated the Joint Incident Management Team to facilitate a coordinated response. So what happened? In essence, uh, the source was found to be Tiger Brands Enterprise Production Facility. What happened here um, in, sorry, in the facility itself uh, was that um, the cooked polonies uh, entered the brine tank from the boiler. So uh, as in all poloni production facilities, uh, poloni was mixed up, uh, the raw ingredients were mixed up and extruded into a casing. They were put into a boiler in a casing and then in this over here uh, cooling tank, um, they, uh, they, there's a central like Archimedes type screw that pushes these uh, uh, polonies through to the, the end of the brine cooling tank and uh, the water in this cooling tank uh, was changed very infrequently and um, in fact uh, organic material contaminated this cooling tank and the water uh, was maintained at minus 5 degrees centigrade with 15% salt. These are all ideal conditions for Listeria monocytogenes. And the problem was that uh, these brine cooling tanks were not cleaned. They were, um, the water was emptied once a week. Uh, there was organic material and detritus in, in the cooling tank. The, uh, the quality people at Tiger Brands did not recognize that this was in fact a critical control point because to their mind, the polony was cooked in the bag and did not have any, um, uh, there was no, no risk to the actual meat of the polony. But what actually happened was that during the uh, cooling process, the polony shrunk and uh, some brine from the uh, cooling tank entered into the, the, the ends of the polony chubs and then the exterior casing got contaminated with listeria. And of course then uh, it uh, permeated through the entire distribution uh, network and uh, caused a whole lot of cross-contamination in the retail and home space, um, resulting in the biggest outbreak of listeriosis um, in the world. Um, so you can see using this epidemiological curve, oh dear, sorry, that the, uh, um, that the outbreak itself uh, began to die down uh, after the uh, recall was announced in March and uh, currently um, the outbreak is over. Um, we're still continuing with surveillance. So outbreaks of listeriosis are globally amongst the most challenging to investigate because the incubation period of the disease is long, the diagnostic testing uh, has a long turnaround time, it's expensive and requires collaboration amongst multiple stakeholders, uh, food sources are often obscure, and what we found was that industry is often not cooperative because lots is at stake. Uh, Multi-sectoral collaboration is necessary to conduct these investigations. Um, so this over here is a timeline superimposed on the epidemic curve um, so that you can see uh, what happened. Um, one of our, uh, uh, I always say that behind every uh, outbreak there is a, uh, a, 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 behind every dark cloud there's a silver lining. Behind every outbreak there are always uh, lessons to be learned and uh, things to take home and prepare to avoid the next outbreak. Um, there's lots been done behind the scenes to, to uh, make food safer, and hopefully um, this discussion will uh, lead to uh, highlighting some of those. So thank you very much. Um, hope that's a uh, uh, good enough overview. Thanks, Kerrigan. Thanks so much for that. Um, I, of, of course, on a lighter note, if you saw the uh, press release two weeks ago that there's no Elmona anymore, did you see that one? So it's sterile now for all practical reasons. <laughs> Um, may I ask you, uh, and it may be a bit of an unfair question, because you mentioned specifically what your niche and responsibility was. But in terms of the, the influence of culture, and maybe what you've seen and what you've grasped from, uh, what do you think is the influence and what do you think we can do in terms of, of, of also collaborating with you in, in terms of setting a better food safety culture? We've seen um, a lot of different role players here. Even in the US, we've seen much closer movement of industry to, for example, like the FDA, realizing that we need to start talking to, one, to each other. So your, your, your perspectives on that. Thanks. Uh, we, we visited a number of facilities and uh, obviously engaged a lot with environmental health practitioners. 
And there was a definite um, disparate uh, approach to food safety uh, across the different companies that we engaged with, ranging from uh, we not at risk to uh, appropriate, what I would call appropriate vigilance. And uh, I overheard a little bit of the last talk. I can't emphasize how much uh, food safety is uh, an essential part of uh, our modern day culture and society. Um, I think uh, one of the challenges that people in the food production industry face um, is that there seems to be a very uh, remote connection between the manufacturing process and the consumption process. Mm -hmm. And that disconnection leads people to take their responsibilities around food safety lightly. One of the, um, the sad things that we had to do was interview uh, patients who had had listeriosis or mothers who had lost children. And it's completely disheartening um, and, and tragic to realize uh, and to speak firsthand with mothers who had lost children, um, uh, stories of people, mothers who never ate bologna themselves, but they used to put bologna sandwiches, uh, make bologna sandwiches for their children. Um, uh, children themselves between the ages of one and 15 who got listeriosis because they were fed bologna. Uh, these are all the innocent bystanders of uh, food, uh, poor food safety culture. And I think the food uh, industry has not taken uh, food safety seriously enough. Um, and uh, we've made world history in, in a very infamous way uh, because of that. Thank you. Thank you, Kerrigan, so much. We're going to let you off the hook because you're on your way. I think you've got another appointment. Thank you so much for your contributions, but you're welcome to stay and listen further. Thank you so much. So we've got Voter. Voter, uh, welcome, and thanks for your, your, in, your um, inputs. And thanks for, 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 for also being on our panel. Um, Voter will share with us uh, some ideas from the NSF, and we hand over to him for a, for a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, so far today, we've had a lot, we have heard a lot about what food safety culture is. But how do you measure where your company is in terms of scale or compared to others? Uh, the maturity model was developed about five years ago and, was, um, and has helped many companies to establish where they stand in terms of their culture and attitudes towards food safety. So how did the model evolve? We kept looking, looking at hundreds of BRCs, IFS, SQFs and FSC reports, trended all the recurring non-compliances and food safety issues and asked why. Why do some companies keep failing on certain things? We re reviewed the reports and trended the non-compliance data, and we also reviewed um, significant food safety incidents to ask, what is it? And what, that's how we came about the framework of the maturity model. And then we fine-tuned it and made it more sophisticated for over a period of years. So um, what is the model? It is basically four generations of maturity measured against four markers. We use it um, in all the food categories of manufacturing, retail, restaurant, hospitality, you know, the, the wine industry, meat industry, and so on. It is not a technical assessment. Whilst you've got technical walkthroughs and things like that, it's about providing a clear gap analysis and a roadmap of all the actions that people got to do based on the methodology, which I'll explain in a second. The reason companies do this is interesting. Some that had a crisis, who may be in a reactive mode, might want to look at something like this in a way of trying to recover their position that they got themselves in. Or again, other reactive reactions could be, we got a near miss in terms of food safety, or they may have had a major recall, which wasn't caused by any food, sa uh, by, it hasn't caused any food safety problems or anything, but it's been a withdrawal rather than a product recall. Then proactively, companies may want to um, want an objective, independent, and tested organizational diagnostic to say, where are we? What do we want? Where do we want to be? And again, that links to culture. Do we have the this is how we do things here type of culture? So it's really understanding the company and putting the risk, uh, the, the food safety risk in the context of financial and brand risk. 
Um, so this shows you the broader bullet point definitions of what the culture generations are. Generation one, no formal policies, variable standards, budget for food safety doesn't exist, it is a cost-driven culture, and there's no real budget for food safety. So each one of you can now try to see where you fit in, uh, on, on this scale. For generation two, these, um, these policies might exist, but they are not owned. The senior leadership doesn't own them, and people don't believe in them. There is a budget, but it's seen as a cost. And when you talk to some people, you get questions about the high cleaning and sanitation cost, and how much does it cost to get a good quality manager. Standards are always seen as impractical, and quite often people uh, work around it. In generation three, you get the, that the policies exist, you get management commitment, better communication, and probably good food safety management at senior middle management level, but not necessarily at the top. And internal and external audits are used effectively, and they are making that positive, proactive steps forward. Whereas in generation four, basically you are looking at an industry leader, fully committed, leading edge policies and standards, excellent communication, and commitment across all parts of the business. Like strong in internal and external auditing formats and reviews, things like root cause analysis and all that sort of thing, and benchmarking themselves against the industry and other food groups. And they actually see food, uh, food safety as something that is a competitive advantage because it is protecting the brand. So basically, you are moving on the bottom of the left-hand side from a reactive based company to someone that is proactively managing food safety culture and everything associated with that. This staircase is really showing that in generation one, control is mandated, and in generation two, compliance is practiced. But you can see that there's a purposefully a gap in the staircase where you've got to make up a, a quite a leap to get up to generation three and four. Um, where you get uh, to that significant border crossing. You've got the embedded knowledge and the embedded behavior that the companies in generation three and four generally exhibit. So how do you determine uh, at, in what generation you are? Um, these are the nine markers we use. So if we go from the right to the left, the IT systems is more about whether systems talk to each other is the data managed effectively. You know, you quite often go to some companies and they got old legacy systems that don't talk to each other. You've got people running spreadsheets in the background and all that kind of things. What's the, what is the traceability systems like? What types of auditing do they do in terms of internal, external, certified, second party and consulting audits? How do they lay out their training? Is it appropriate to the jobs? What policies and standards do they set for themselves? And what is the overall management structure like in terms of particularly culture, but also things like regulatory compliance? What is their track record with regulators? Do they enhance regulation? Do they get regular updates? Do they lobby and influence regulators? And this all builds to the culture awareness within the company. Is this a positive culture of managing the business and food safety risk in the context of the brand? So um, when, do we, uh, when we do the data collection, we'll first of all get documents and do system assessment. And then we get the management to predict where they are on the maturity scale in terms of markers. And then we ask them where they would like to be. So where do you think you are now and where do you think you, will, you, you would like to be? Then we do many structured interviews from the shop floor right to the CEO. And then some clients like, like the idea of us talking to their suppliers and their clients. And we let them tell us what they think of us. And that's pretty uh, soul searching. Um, so this slide is what, what the clients really want in the end is um, Finally, the output. Um, we, we will look uh, at where the business initially considered itself to be in the maturity model, uh, the desired position, and the actual position. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, when people give themselves an initial view, 
they quite often, uh, at least half a generation off, they overrate themselves. So the green line is where the, they originally estimated themselves to be. So in this case, it's about uh, generation 2.3 or 2.4, uh, yeah, 2.3. Um, where the um, purple line is where they, they would like to be. And, and the red line is the actual position based on the assessment. So when you plot each of the nine markers with the blue bars, and uh, you would say, are you progressing or are you regressing on those areas? So um, that now that in some areas you might not be in generation three or four, but they are moving the right direction. Whereas in other areas, they are going backwards. So this is really where you look at cross-section of the business to see where the disconnects are. It's about looking at all these disconnects and seeing where within the different markers the disconnects are. Sometimes you find that the owners sit in their ivory towers thinking everything is wonderful and everything is operating fantastically down below. And then lo and behold, it's not. And at some point they are going to have a food safety crash. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Voter. Um, thanks for sharing with us. Uh, may I just, and I think you've answered some of these questions already or some of these principles you've touched on, but um, what, what, what can a company expect um, uh, during a BRC food safety culture audit? And um, share with us a little bit of, 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 of your offerings. Okay, as you know, the, the, the current version of the BRC standard um, already has a food safety culture assessment thing, but it's voluntary. And the new version will, will obviously has, have it as well, and it will still be voluntary. But in the new version, they've added um, quite a few additional points, specifically in the area of senior management commitment. So you'll basically find the differences in, in terms of that. Um, I can just look here at um, some of the things. So the BRC culture excellence assessment has been available in, in the current issue. Um, about, uh, um, a brand new requirement has, has added to, to uh, issue eight requiring senior management to define and maintain a clear plan for the development and continuing improvement of food safety and uh, quality culture. So this is not part of the, the um, uh, uh, it, it's a compulsory part of the standard. So during an audit against BRC issue 8, the auditor will expect your senior management to lead the discussion and explain uh, and explanations on development, measurement, and planning to improve the site's food safety culture with clear objectives, timelines, and evidence of forward momentum. The auditor would fur further establish the awareness level of your staff. The company will also be expected to have a confidential reporting system to staff to report concerns related to product safety, integrity, quality, and legality. Well, I think in a nutshell, thank you for that, um, Oter, for, for sharing with us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on. Um, I think the day is also getting long. You've been listening, and I was looking, and you really are still concentrating. It's wonderful. Um, can I, uh, it's my pleasure to go to, to, to hand over to Professor Lucia Annelich. Um, which is also, Lucia, a big advocate of food safety and a leader in our country with regard to this, also um, abroad. So, uh, Lucia, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ray, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a few slides, really, about the, um, uh, what the International Association for Food Protection is doing regarding food safety culture. So, um, I was invited to, uh, to attend the IAFP meeting this year, it was held in July, in Salt Lake City to speak on the listeriosis outbreak and lessons learned. And at the same time, they were running a number of these uh, different groups, and this is typical what IAFP actually does. So, they've got like a foodborne disease outbreak professional development group, and many, many others. There's just a very long list. You can actually go to their website and it will show you all the different professional development groups that they have on the go. So this was a new one that was specifically developed, the Professional Development Group for Food Safety Culture. So it was the first time this year that interested persons could uh, participate in this kind of discussion. And really it was just looking at uh, a number of dimensions which were identified. Uh, so that we looked at hazard and risk awareness, vision and mission of the organization, people in education, 
adaptability, and consistency. And each one of these dimensions were then broken down into much, much more detail. Um, and in the limited time I have, I can't go into all of those, but I have tried to highlight just a few. So uh, how it happened is we were divided into groups and uh, spread out in the room, much, much the same as this kind of room, uh, maybe a little larger. And each group had a facilitator and we had these little um, yellow post-its and we could write whatever we thought about those five dimensions on the post-its and they were then put on the wall. And from those, we sort of reorganized them and tried to cluster them. And we came up with this final uh, document, really, that shows how we put them together. So under hazard and risk awareness, some of the uh, sub-dimensions we, we identified were, for example, functional hazard information in education. And this is about the technical stuff, that it's important still to have the technical training. But identifying also different learning styles because not everybody learns in the same way. We've got left-brained people, we've got right-brained people, and the learning is different. Uh, right-brained people w learn better with pictures, and left-brained people like wording and, and very sort of organized fashion uh, of, 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 of understanding and learning, setting norms, and so on. Um, employee engagement, we heard about that earlier on as well by Esther, who spoke a lot about that. And this is about associates that could teach back to their people, and also a buddy-buddy system, where a, a more senior person could, could sort of mentor uh, new individuals that come into the organization. Rewards and recognition is something that was also explained earlier on. Uh, employee idea system. Um, I've recently been involved with a company in South Africa where there's a terrific internal politics. And as far as I'm concerned, internal politics is everywhere for sure. But in this particular company, it is so bad that I think it's public enemy number one when it comes to implementing a good food safety culture. And um, uh, this employee idea system was actually quashed. People who came up with ideas were actually told, that's not your job. Just keep quiet and go back and do what you were supposed to be doing. I think that's absolutely dreadful. Ownership and re responsibility, uh, engaging people and giving them ownership of, uh, ownership of the work that they are doing. Um, employees are also customers, understanding that um, if I am delivering an intermediate product to a different section of the organization, that section, even though it's the same company, is my customer. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, point also to, to drive home. Verify hazard and risk awareness. Show me, don't just tell me, but show me. And connect KPIs with behavior. And I think that's a very important point. Um, questions that you could actually ask in a case study in a group is, you've learned all of this today. Will you stop the line? Will you take that responsibility to stop the line if you see something that is not actually correct? Uh, those kind of questions uh, come up and, and came up in this, in this um, categorization. And using mock exercise outcomes, I think, is also very important. Regarding the vision and the mission of the organization, it's all about leadership and messaging, open and transparent communication, making a message memorable. What is it that is the core of the message and how do you make it memorable to an employee? Regular contact with leaders, and workers, and having a one-on-one -on -one discussion and recognition, understanding the culture and the background of your employees. Uh, in South Africa, we've got such a wide diversity of cultures. We need to understand that. And um, I'm reminded of a, a fantastic uh, incident where I was uh, in Swaziland on opening a, a new sugar factory in Swaziland. And the Zulu king arrived, or the Swazi king rather, arrived with all his regalia, animal, um, you know, uh, prints and his feathers and everything else, and he looked absolutely stunning. But the culture of the organization was you have to wear protective clothing if you are going to go into the business. You can't go with your feathers and everything else. And he said, no problem. He put on his protective clothing with a mop cap and everything else, and I tell you what, that single uh, change of what he did 
change the culture in that organization completely. It was never necessary ever again to tell an employee, wear your protective clothing, put on your mop cap to cover your hair, put on your uh, moustache sno snood or beard snood, etc. It was just done and dusted because a, a, a respected person came in and actually did that. And I think that's important. So uh, setting an example by your own actions is very important. So top-down approach, yes, but we also need to have a bottom-up approach and listen to employees, listen to suggestions. They're the ones at the coal face. They know what's going on. You said CEOs sit in this ivory towers. Even more reason why they should be listening to their employees. Setting directions and expectations, linking company performance with employee performance and consistency in accountability. And then people in education was actually really, really broad. Um, I've tried to condense it in these three bits. Innovative learning approaches, online learning, gamification, uh, coaching, mentoring, and so on. Communication strategies, different types of communication strategies in a company. Rewards and recognition, we mentioned that all also earlier. So you'll see, obviously, there's a little bit of overlap between the different groups because this is all about people at the end of the day. Adaptability was communication to enable effective change, like empowering team members, motivational strategies that could be implemented, having burning platforms where uh, these discussions can be held, end-to-end -end ownership and dialogue, continuous improvement mindset. That was really important, and I must say that was highlighted quite a lot during these discussions. And then consistency, a food safety culture strategy should be implemented. Uh, there should be information access and sharing new information. And then, of course, we've already spoken about rewards and recognition, but there should also be consequences linked to KPIs, also mentioned in a previous slide. So those are the five um, dimensions. So what are the plans going forward? Well, basically, this professional development group uh, would need to refine a little bit these uh, five dimensions and all the, uh, the portions that have been identified be beneath those. Uh, the idea is also to develop some best practice documents that will then be a um, available freely for anyone to download them from the IAFP website. Um, working groups would probably be also formulated and developing also a knowledge and competency framework. Some articles will most likely be written uh, in, in journals and in also popular magazines. And then, of course, further IAFP symposia have been um, mo mooted as an idea to go forward and to promote this uh, food safety culture uh, activity that this professional development group uh, would be doing for future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Um, you were mentioning the methods to create a culture and thinking out of the box. We learned this morning from, uh, also from Benny Anderson, uh, um, uh, out of the box thinking. I remember Linda and I, and this is a true story, when we went for training, we had to write a song together. Really, we had to write a song and we had to perform the song for the entire audience, a song on culture and the type of culture. So it just shows you how you can being put on the spot. Um, Lucia, thanks so much for that presentation. In, in terms of your opinion in South Africa, and uh, uh, um, especially on management level, how ready are we to engage with the issue of food safety culture? I don't like to generalize. I think there are some companies in South Africa that are already on, the, on a, a good road, a strong road towards a positive food safety culture, to use the psychological terms of negative and positive rather than good and bad. Um, I think, though, there are still some that are not even close. Um, and as I mentioned, an example, and there are others as well. I think also um, food, saf food, food safety in South Africa has unfortunately been um, mostly in the, in the realm of industry. So industry is heavily self-regulated in this country because of the lack of enforcement of regulations. Um, so it's always really been uh, a question of, I, I just need to do the minimum in many, many cases. Um, and also because HACCP or a HACCP-based food safety management system is not mandatory in this country across the board. And I've had a recent discussion on this with, with, with a, a particular industry sector. And I suggested that we should actually promote this 
uh, across any forums we come across, like FLAG, etc., where I do serve. And one of these industry associations actually said, no, our industry um, is not interested in having mandatory HACCP uh, implemented. And it's actually a high-risk industry. And I thought to myself, how is this possible? So there are also vested interests, and we have to be aware of those, because those are also going to have influence a positive food safety culture or implementation of such a culture. So we've got so many things to take care of. Um, also, uh, there is a company, uh, a multinational, that has done an investigation into the failures over the past 20 years in their business. And 70% of those failures were due to a human element. And, and it's true, you can actually see this in most, most cases where there's a failure of, of, of food safety. So yes, food safety culture is definitely needed. Um, I, I think it's a question of um, companies may not realize they need it, they are ready for it, but they may, might not realize that they actually need it. So it's almost like you know, admitting that you're an alcoholic. When you do at least admit you're an alcoholic, it's already 50% of the battle won. And I think food safety culture is almost falling in the same realm. So um, yeah, that's my comment about South African food industry. Thank you very much, Lucia. I think you've put it very nicely in a nutshell. And we've also seen this, this denial in some of these cases coming from some uh, of our top managers and leaders. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Blaine von Rensburg from Sovereign Foods. And uh, thank you for coming, Blaine. We hand over to you. Look. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, I moved chairs because I wanted some of Lucia's knowledge and experience to rub off. <laughs> no, um, I just I didn't have my notes with me because they're all on the computer. So. Yeah, just a, um, a little introduction to who Sovereign Foods is. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, we were inadvertently dragged into the, the onset of the, the listeriosis issue. Um, and by hook or by, no, not by crook, but by thorough focus and, and effort and communication, we managed to, to work our way through it alongside um, regulators and, and enforcers as well as our customers because um, these things have the potential to, to damage the brand um, irreparably, and I think there's enough examples of that around the globe as well as in South Africa today. So, um, so just a, an introduction of who we are. So Sovereign Foods is a, a vertically integrated broiler producer. So for, if you don't know what that is, it's, we've got the, the breeding stock, the hatcheries, the feed mills, um, the broiler farms, the production outfits, distribution, sales and marketing, etc. So we take care of a whole, a whole host of the supply chain. Uh, we've got three plants. We do about 1.8 million birds um, a week, and uh, yeah, we we do. It's a, about 11,000 tons worth of of uh, products, depending on on the the, the slaughter schedules, etc. But across a wide range of different products, both primary, secondary, and further processed, and these are in fully cooked format, in raw, fresh, and frozen. So. Um, quite a smorgasbord of risk that we, we, have, to, we have to take care of. Um, from a, a compliance perspective, all three of the plants are FSSE 22,000 um, certified or accredited. I'm never sure which, which term to use. Certified, thank you. Um, and from a health and safety perspective, we, we've run both of our plants at a uh, NOSA five-star level, um, one of which is running at NOSCAR. So we've been focused on getting external validation of what our processes are for quite a long time now. Um, yeah, from, a, from a, an investment or a commitment perspective, financially, we, we put a lot into our, our facilities and our, our compliance programs. So 18 million rand over three years is just centered on food safety compliance. Um, we do around 2 million rand a year worth of just microbiological monitoring. Um, we've got 53 quality or quality aligned staff, including inspection and validation staff. So um, with all of this in place, doesn't mean that we're perfect, doesn't mean that uh, we're the best out there. We still get things wrong, because if we didn't, I would have been here for the morning session. So I had to appear before a, a customer and please explain why we did badly in a, in a systems audit and what we were doing about it. So. I really wanted to be here, so um, thank you for indulging me and, and letting me be on the second, second panel. So a little bit about sovereign foods and food safety culture, um, and it really just 
it starts out with our, our vision and values. So we've really, probably for the last seven years now, been pushing food safety, quality, efficiency, and a number of different values as a core competency for us as a business. Um, to the extent that we, we built it into our performance reviews from a T8 right up to a T24 level. So the, T, the CEO is going to be around a T24. T8, for example, would be just below artisan level, so machine minders, supervisors, quality staff, etc. <coughs> Excuse me, etc. So from that perspective, we, we try and assess, and it's very difficult, and I'm, I'm intrigued from what I've heard of the, the few presentations so far, on how to measure compliance with um, or a food safety culture. And some of the things that we've included in our performance reviews have been both a, an upward and a cross assessment of how people are living those values. So positive and negative examples uh, that people don't assess themselves, but they assess their superior or assess their peers on positive uh, contribution towards the values or posi positive, what's the word I'm looking for, um, demonstration of, of the values as well as negative. So we can work on them together. And from a quality perspective, um, we believe that quality and food safety for that matter is engineered in, it's not inspected in. Um, to this end, we, we actually have production aligned quality monitoring staff and those staff report to the production people. So I can sense a, a, a bit of uneasiness in the room and we believe that because production people can't be everywhere all the time and they need eyes and ears on the ground to help them pick out where things are going wrong, escalate it for their attention so they can take action. Um, the, the control we have in place is that we have a, a system of validation quality staff as well that would go around and independently check that these things are happening. Um, again, they also can't be everywhere at all, at all times. So we have, let's say, somewhat something of a fail-safe in place to make sure that we A, pick up problems, B, react to problems, and escalate them where things can't be, be, be dealt with timelessly. From a customer satisfaction perspective, that's both internal and external, um, making sure that we deliver against our, our customer requirements and we we service a whole, a whole wide range of, of industries from retail, wholesale, food service, QSR, um, both local and internationally. So trying to digest the expectations of customers, put that into your, your food safety management systems and then express it as an output for, um, for your staff to go and live is something that we, we try and focus very hard on and it's, it's, it's a continuous effort. Efficiency. Um, this is really just saying what we do and doing what we say. Um, the, the, the production people in the room would look at efficiency and say, no, I want my numbers, I want my output, I want my results. Efficiency doesn't do that at the cost of quality and food safety. So that's why the, the, the values are in a circle and it's all centered around achieving our vision. Um, I sound like a bit of a management guru, but the, these are, are things that we... we we communicate consistently. So every senior management meeting, we go through the values, we talk about them, we, we debate them. And believe me, this is version seven of how we express these things um, because they continuously get refined. We communicate it company-wide twice a year. So we, have, um, we, we take a day out of production across the business for an entire day where we just talk about the business itself and we start out with the values. So that we, we highlight areas where we believe we haven't been quite as um, consistent as we'd like in terms of our values. Uh, yeah, self-belief, that's really just about confidence. You know, we have confidence in the things we've implemented and where we haven't implemented quite as well as we, we would like to, um, we have the confidence in our abilities to go in and fix the problems in, a, in as quickly, a, in a, as timely a manner as possible. And team success. This is, um, I think, what uh, one of the previous um, speakers was referring to, is that uh, one department succeeding at the expense of another. Um, and how we, we try and eliminate that from tying, by tying all of these, these efforts together. Um, so, yeah. so from a 
from a, a values perspective, they really are foundational in terms of what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve them. Um, and nothing is, sac is, is, is a sacrificial lamb in this, in this instance. So, um, you know, firstly, starting out with respect, how we treat each other, how we work together as teams, um, how we converse, how we communicate. It's, um, it's something that we, we, we've been hammering hard on. Um, but, you know, the, the experience is how people come into our business and assess us from the outside. And those um, feedback sessions are often quite enlightening. We have a strategy process once a year where we send out consultants to go and speak to our customers. And they talk about us and how we approach business with them and how our products serve the needs that they have and how we compare with the people across, uh, across the industry. And uh, the learnings that come out of that go straight up to a board level. Um, and we have a number of initiatives, which I'll talk, talk to in a minute, that, that escalate to a board level as well. So what does this all practically mean for us? So awareness is obviously a big thing from a food safety perspective. And how do you consistently communicate that to every level of the organization, uh, both up across and down. Um, we have obviously training programs and uh, you, know, you can never do enough training, um, but the financial people always say, well, you can always do too much. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I, I think it was Richard Branson that, that said, well, you know, one of his employees were complaining, well, what if we train people and they leave? Um, and his response was, well, what if you don't train them and they stay? So. <laughs> So it's something that we, 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 we obviously try and put enough effort into uh, making sure that we're out there with the, the latest inputs from a, from a food safety training perspective. Uh, we don't get the opportunity to do that as often as we'd like, but where training is done, it's done in production hours. So we take people off out of their jobs, put them into a, a facility where there's no dis distraction, no disturbances, and give them the exposure to the food safety legislation, the, the standards that we're trying to achieve, et cetera, and give them the practical tools to manage food safety incidents going forward. Induction programs, this is maybe a, a, a little bit more superficial than the in-depth training, but every employee that comes into the business goes through an induction process. Um, we give them our food safety policies. Um, we take them through a short presentation around what food safety means to us. And that goes right down to the general worker on the floor um, at a, a little bit of a lower level. Dissemination of information, uh, how do we share what we're seeing from a food safety perspective? Customer complaints are all brought in, they're all logged, they're all shared across um, a variety of platforms. And uh, the, the teams that work around resolving food, food safety issues or customer complaints see everything. So we don't exclude anything. And where there's a particular food safety incident that is serious enough, that gets escalated to the CEO level. And we have a quarterly review with the CEO across all of our food safety issues, customer complaints, and micro microbiological trends, so that he's aware of where we're sitting, where our challenges are, and where we're requiring support, both financially and just you know, in terms of time and space. Then diversity programs, um, having plants in different parts of the country, um, I was amazed at how different the approach needs to be in certain areas. Um, work ethics are different, understandings, understandings are different, um, you know, cultures are different and practices are different. So you need to take all of these things into account. And we run diversity programs um, at this stage mostly at a, at a senior to middle management level so that we, we help people foster environments where where teams can work together without getting into confrontations. Communication mediums, so this is where we have a couple of, of things that uh, allow people to, to voice their concerns, raise issues, um, whether they want to be anonymous or not, it's up to them. Um, so I have an ethics hotline that bypasses the entire management team, ends up straight on the board's table. Um, we have a talk to us, which is a, a company-wide um, utility that can go online and talk to us, they can have a written submission, they can communicate on a number of different platforms about anything. It doesn't matter what it is, they can complain about the, the lunch in the canteen, they can talk about um, you know, medical aid, they can talk about whatever they want. And 
some instances of food safety have started kind of bubbling up in, in, in these discussions, which is great, and uh, we encourage it. Um, suggestion boxes we do have. Um, I haven't had great success with it, to be honest. Um, we, we end up with um, quite strange suggestions that are not related to anything remotely uh, food safety at this stage. So, um, but you know, we, we'll, we'll keep trying to give feedback via our, our, um, our um, industrial forums using the, the food safety teams as well as the shop stewards. And then company-wide dashboards, so we, we're in the process of, of implementing um, an enterprise risk management system which takes all incidents into account, both health and safety and food safety. These dashboards would be visible to anybody anywhere across the company for, to see how we're doing. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing the output of that probably in the next two to three months. It's been a, quite a, a process to try and, try and encapsulate everything that we wanted into this process. And then uh, yeah, our food safety and quality structure, I've spoken about production owned and QA validated, so I won't go there. And then open door pol policy. Um, my door is always open, um, and our QA staff will, will tell you that they're free to come and raise any issue with me at any time. Um, I have production staff walking off the floor into my office all the time to say, well, yeah, can you help me with this? Or I've seen that. So, um, and that's, that's common across our, our business. So it's, it's not something that um, we tried to implement, it's happened by default because we, we run a pretty flat organizational structure, so staff have access to you all the time. Sorry, wrong button. So what did we learn from our involvement in the listeriosis outbreak? Um, so number one, complacency is our worst enemy. And I don't say that we were complacent, but we weren't proactive enough around what's out there, what's what's next level, what are, what are the, the things that are on the horizon that could be bubbling up. I mean, the latest thing is microplastics in the human digestive system. Uh, are we thinking about those things? You know, how could it impact on the products that we manufacture, sell, the, the ingredients we buy, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, those are, are items that are potentially so way out there that, um, that a chicken producer from Utenag might not want to think about it, but you know, those, those are the things that we, we, we have to start thinking about. Um, increased benchmarking. So we, we find it very difficult to benchmark what we do locally because most facilities and most systems and most other producers have closed doors because we're competitors. So, so we, we do quite an extensive effort to benchmark ourselves globally. Um, and in many organizations, the global travel is, is the exclusive preserve of the executive. We try and spread that love a little bit more widely. I've just come back from a two-week trip where I took plant managers, I took uh, project engineers with to have a look and just expose them to different facilities and different practices worldwide. And I'm still amazed at what I, I see. Um, you know, I walked into a facility in Italy that's doing 27,000 birds an hour um, massive plant and uh, put shoe covers on, put a, a, a lab coat on with a hairnet, walked to the plant, no hand washing, no, no boot washing um, into a facility. You could pick up product, handle it and walk out. And this is a, a European producer. producer. Um, if we did that in any audit in this country, you get crucified. Um, and you think, well, take a step back and ask why, why do they do it? You walk through that poultry plant and uh, for those of you that have seen a poultry plant, it's often not a pretty place, but it's wet. This factory was absolutely bone dry. Um, the floor was dry, the, the product was dry, the conveyor belts were dry. They put a huge amount of effort into just keeping moisture out of the process. And you know, those are little things that, that kind of stick with your production people and making sure that they can see what's achievable with, with you know, not that much effort. Continuous improvement is exactly that. Uh, you've never arrived, you're always on a journey. Um, it's about, well, I've gotten to my, my goal, so what's the next goal? Where do we need to go next? Then from a, a regulation perspective, go beyond what's expected. Um, our, our regulatory framework in this country, as has been pointed out on a number of occasions, is lacking. Um, and the poultry industry in particular has been self-regulated in many respects for, for far too long. Um, 
but regulations are just the baseline. It's just the absolute minimum of what's expected. Customer requirements on top of that are very often, and for those who've been through food safety audits with uh, the retailers would understand that it, they're a lot higher than the minimum. And what I'd suggest is go beyond that. You know, have a look at exceeding those expectations in many respects, setting higher standards for yourselves. Then reevaluate, redesign, re-implement. Um, we have black swan events like listeriosis that came out of left field and really shook us um, from, a, from an industry perspective or a company perspective. Um, look at what those particular things could be and think around how, how we're going to cope with that. And then when it, if it comes out of left field and takes you by surprise, go and redesign your processes because it, it's, it's required. It's, uh, it's an obligation and you know, today's system is not necessarily good enough for tomorrow. And then changing culture is hard. Um, yeah, the, the facility that we, we brought on, on board in, in October 2015 was where the, the, the uh, listeriosis hit home for us. And it's, it's hard to integrate new teams into, into an existing food safety culture um, because they come with baggage. And you need to help them unlearn a lot of that and relearn a whole, new, whole host of new um, habits. Then, just, so just in summary, for us, food safety culture is not a de destination, it's a journey. Um, and to steal a quote from, from Jim Collins, uh, you've got to confront the brutal facts because you're going to have them. As good as your systems can be, you're going to have moments where you, you are surprised by things and where things don't go according to plan. Just face the facts, deal with it, and then work as a team to get past them. And I think Lucia pointed out top, top down and bottom up approach. Um, management can create a framework with, within which food, uh, food safety culture can flourish. Um, they can provide the support and the financial backing. But unless there's freedom at uh, a base level for people to come up with the food safety issues, you're going to have a ivory tower scenario, as, as uh, Lucia pointed out earlier. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Blaine. Just briefly, um, your, uh, give us an idea of the rest of the, your, your opinion of the rest of the chicken processing industry outside of your own company and what the situation is there. And I may be unfair. Or... I think I should have checked the attendance register before I mentioned the <laughs> opinion. No, I'm joking. I, I think in, in reality, it's going to be on a continuum from very little food safety culture to um, something around proactive and positive. Uh, many of the major producers would be dealing with retailers um, that have a lot higher standards, standards than the minimum, QSR um, um, customers that um, have even higher standards than that. So I think you're going to find pockets of, of excellence, you're going to find pockets of apathy. That's, uh, I think, in reality for, for any, any industry. Um, uh, for for a, a producer who, who's doing 2 million birds a week or, or 1.5 million uh, birds a week or 500,000 birds a week. If you look at the South African poultry industry as a whole, 95% of the productive capacity is probably taken up in the top 12 producers. So, and within those producers, you'll find still a variety of different approaches to, to food safety. And uh, uh, I think the, 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 the recent history has both track and them as well as their customers. And certainly what we found is that customers are, are asking a lot more thorough questions about, uh, about food safety incidents than they have in the past. So some room for improvement still. Thank you so much. And our last presenter, ladies and gentlemen, thanks, Blaine, is uh, um, uh, the, the, the lady of the moment, uh, Linda Jackson. Um, and she's going to present to us uh, some of her perspectives and also share with us her uh, trials and tribulations and efforts, really having a passion for food safety culture, the issue of culture, the issue of empathy, and how she, via her company and her colleagues, tried to establish this uh, in South Africa. Then over to you. Thanks, Rick. Actually, I, I'm going to highlight more in, you know, in, in terms of the international perspectives and just really showing what we need to be considering. So these are some quotes just taken from... Um, 
the international trends. Um, this is an interesting one because it was December 2015 where um, you actually see the impact of FISMA for the first time um, as well as the implication within FISMA with regards to food safety culture. So what I'm trying to highlight here is the regulatory involvement in other parts of the world uh, when it comes to food safety culture. So this is the Americans. Um, we voters spoke through uh, a, a little bit with regards to the BRC model and, and how that's been um, looked at. This is obviously a voluntary model. Um, the GFSI uh, very recently, as Chris mentioned, put out a um, food safety culture position paper. Um, there's a whole range of different uh, documents that are available. So please check out mygfsi.com for um, the retailer perspective, or rather the GFSI mainly retailer perspective um, on food safety culture. Um, in terms of what they're trying to assess, uh, these are kind of like the three big deal issues. This position paper addresses the role of leaders and managers, but in the whole range of sizes of organization, um, the communication, the education, the, the need for metrics and teamwork and personal accountability. I think we've heard these themes coming through all the presentations. And then learn skill hazard awareness. So you, what's interesting to note is the scientists at IFP take picking up on this work um, or, um, in terms of, you know, Lucia's presentation in that regard, I think the timing is quite similar in terms of July being the time that the IFP conference took place um, as well. But if we take it back a little and we go back to 2012, you actually have the UK FSA um, launching a set of guidelines to assist their environmental health practitioners. So these documents were prepared specifically for the enforcers of regulation to try and assist them in building and educating the companies that they were kind of interacting with and helping them to identify aspects of food safety culture and then also importantly how to educate and train and make food companies aware of food safety culture implications. So this goes back to 2012. In the UK, I just think it's quite uh, progressive. Um, the government actually, you know, seeing that it's necessary for regulators, they are influences of our food safety culture and the important role that they play. Uh, when Rake and I were in the US earlier in the year, um, the biggest contingent award <laughs> uh, didn't go to a manufacturer like it did today, but it in fact went to the FDA. The largest single group represented on the course was 12 delegates from the FDA. Um, they also won the singing competition, I have to tell you. Um, but it, it was really very interesting listening to their perspective of food safety culture um, and their experiences of interacting with companies um, and, and, and the strategy that they're putting in place. First of all, to address their own culture. What is our food safety culture as a department? And of, of course, you know, given the various um, regions within the US, and then also how they were, wanted to take this into the, the industries that they were actually servicing. Um, again, you know, given what Salva said earlier, um, I think that's really the route that we should be looking at from a local municipality perspective. Um, we, this was mentioned earlier as well with regards to um, the Australian and New Zealand model. Um, this is on a, uh, again on a, a, a regulatory website where you have uh, an initiative specifically by the government to develop tools and resources to help businesses and regulators through a, a improvement process with regards to their food safety culture. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's in all spheres. We've, see, we've heard the scientists, we've heard the certification bodies, we've heard from manufacturers, you know, we've heard from, the, from, the, from our government you know, from, from local government, from the EHPs, but it's not, this is not going to come right in just one single aspect of the food, say, of the food chain. It's got to be all of us working, um, you know, collectively because in all areas, whether we like it or not, we do have a food safety culture. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, the point that I'm just trying to point or highlight here is that it's a collaborative effort and maybe we could even help each other, you know, in that respect. Um, we could share our learnings from manufacturers to government, vice versa. Maybe we could actually take advice from the government with regards to food safety culture, you know, to, to at the end of the day, make sure that we've got safe food for ourselves as consumers and citizens of South Africa. Um, who's going to drive it? Uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, 
um, you and me, <laughs> that we're going to do this, that we've seen, you know, the need. Um, we've got companies that are sitting here that are, have taken the lead. Lucia mentioned that, you know, there are definitely pockets of excellence out there. There are companies that are doing great things. There are companies that are prepared to teach, which I think is just so great um, because we can all learn from that. And, and I think that, you know, we're, if we're going to sit and wait for someone else to do this, uh, it's not going to happen. <laughs> we've seen this in the past. You know, let's start doing something about it. Let's start in your company. Let's just take some of these principles that we've learned today and let's take them back home and let's try them. Let's take a risk. Let's see if it works. Let's actually talk to people. Wow. Let's actually talk to our employees. Let's actually ask them how they're doing today. You know, let's catch somebody doing something right instead of focusing on the negative. You know, why don't we have a hall of fame? Um, and why don't we actually highlight those people that are doing the right things? You can do that. You as a quality manager can change your tone. You can change your conversation. You know, how often I've had an experience where I've walked through companies on audits and the quality manager, the way that that person is addressing the, a staff member, if it was me, there's no ways I'm going to cooperate with you if that's how you talk to me. Where's the respect? Where's the respect from the quality manager to the team that actually has to implement our food safety management systems? I know you get frustrated, but let's remember, you know, respect, maybe that'll buy us a lot more. You know, my sort of standard effect with regards to maintenance is a lot of chocolate cake. You know, maintenance is often the most difficult department to bring to the party. Chocolate cake has worked wonders in my experience, you know, and it's, it's still moral, it's still legal, and it's not that cost, you know, it's not that expensive. Like, um, you know, like Jane mentioned, a lot of these things are not expensive. You can do that. You can walk into a maintenance manager's office with a chocolate cake. You can surprise the living daylights out of that person, and you might just get done what you need to get done. And you know what? Does that not achieve the purpose at the end of the day by us as food safety professionals changing our attitude towards the people that we work with, expecting them to do the right thing rather than, you know, expecting them to do the wrong thing? Because don't they live up to our expectations at the end of the day? Um, you know, do we need a South African model? I think we've looked at several models today. You know, there's a, there's a whole host of research that's been done. Do we need to go and reinvent a wheel? Or are there things that are unique about our country? We've spoken about the cultural diversity and how this impacts on the organizational culture of a business. And do we need to take this into account in, in how we, first of all, measure where we are on this continuum and then what tasks or, or what initiatives do we embark on in, in going forward? And then, you know, my take on the role players is that it should be a, an inclusive um, activity. This tragedy has impacted a, on us all. And so it should be all of us that are going forward and looking for better ways to improve our food safety, uh, you know, in South Africa. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's it for, for, for this. Um, can I... Can I, can I just uh, uh, give uh, Linda also just a chance for one question? And, and, and this is, uh, I think, one that um, she's got a lot of experience in. We know one another about 15, 20 years. And she introduced me, for example, first to the Chris Griffiths and the Frank Yannis, which I'm very thankful for. So this has actually been happening for a number of years already. Her experience about, about how wonderful you are to come to the table and participating and her experience from industry side and different bodies in trying to establish this uh, on behalf of Food Focus. Uh, some of, just very briefly, some of your, your experiences. Well, I don't, uh, yeah, I'm not good at this kind of situation. I just think that I feel we should be building bridges and not walls. And my experience of the uh, outbreak has been that we've built more walls and not enough bridges. You know, unfortunately, the Department of Agriculture were supposed to be here today, and I have to tender apologies on behalf of, of Billy. His flights were uh, changed, which means he was um, kind of stranded in Australia. Um, the Department of Health expressed a lot of interest at the, at the, at the conference, but unfortunately, when we've asked them to present um, and to be part of the process, they haven't been forthcoming. And I think this has been a huge frustration throughout the outbreak where we've asked for input, but we haven't, you know, we haven't 
had it. So I just want to build bridges and I don't want to build walls. And if you can walk with us and we can build bridges and not build walls, I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I kind of like will feel we've done our little bit. So, you know, Food Focus at the end of the day is just a platform to share information. It's a website that just really shares information collaborates, tries to, you know, kind of put everybody in a place where we can uh, share information. And, and I really think that that's the role that we would like to play going forward in, in this particular process. Enough about me. Let's have tea. Thank you. Uh, last uh, um, hands for the, for the panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for participating.